Hello and welcome to Need to Know, the programme that keeps you up to date on the big issues in the world of education. In this programme we look at school trips and the guidance and safety issues that must be observed by school staff. Here to explain these is Mike Baker. From different perspectives, this remains a sensitive area. It is a very sensitive area because there have been some very serious incidents, fatalities indeed, but they are very rare. Nevertheless, they attract an awful lot of publicity and often are followed by an investigation and teachers can end up in court. So the key thing is to remember there are enormous benefits from these trips and we mustn't lose sight of that. But it's about balancing the benefits and the risks. Now, fortunately, there's a lot of new guidance around for teachers and providing they follow that advice and everything should be fine. So to what extent has this had an effect on the willingness of teachers to delete school trips? Well, these concerns do seem to have caused the number of school trips to decline. At one point, the NAS UWT even went as far as advising their members that in an increasingly litigious society, they should not get involved with school trips at all. And all of this is having a direct impact on some subjects, with Ofsted pointing out that the decline in pupils taking geography at GCSE and A-level has partly resulted from reluctance to conduct field trips because of health and safety fears. And recent polling on the topic makes depressing reading. A quarter of teachers say they were worried about taking on responsibility for children's safety. 36% said they were deterred from organising trips by health and safety form filling. And 7% cited reports of accidents and deaths as a worry. Now, the government must be worried about this. Yes, I think they are, because they have given explicit encouragement to school visits and trips, and saying there's plenty of research to show the educational benefits that they bring. And the school secretary, Ed Balls, has said we mustn't allow the compensation culture and the fear of being sued to destroy the long tradition of educational school trips. In a moment, we'll look at the practicalities of ensuring a school trip is safely conducted. But first, let's hear from Adrian Vos from Play England for his view on what he sees as this growing culture of risk aversion. There's a little bit of a culture of, of, of risk aversion not just uh, in, in schools but across all professional sectors that, that work with children um, <clears throat> and you have to question what what the uh, aversion is is to is it the is it the real risk of children coming to harm or is it the risk of professionals uh, facing litigation and sometimes we think it, it it might be the latter and so we're advocating a more robust approach to risk management that as well as weighing up the potential risks of any activity or any environment to children, which of course any professional has to do, good risk assessment. What is also brought into consideration is the purpose of the activity. Well, some of these concerns are also shared by the Conservative opposition. Let's hear from their school spokesman, Nick Gibb. I think the compensation culture has alarmed a lot of schools and that's why there's been a, you know, a drop in the number of, of school trips, and, which I think is a pity for children because it Yes, I mean, yes, of course, school is about academic learning, and, uh, but it's also about uh, a wider experience of life. And if those trips aren't happening because schools are worried about being sued when things go wrong or even facing criminal prosecution, I can understand why the schools don't want to do it. Compensation culture is a real buzz phrase at the moment, but how often do things really go wrong? Well, inevitably, we only ever hear about those occasions where things do go wrong, despite the overwhelming majority of incident-free and very positive educational visits every year. And there have been some high-profile cases. For example, the incident in 2002 where a boy died at Glenridding Beck in Cumbria, or more recently in 2004 when a teenager died when falling from cliffs on a school trip in Cornwall. A select committee report at the end of 2004 found that altogether there had been about 60 fatalities on school trips since 1985. Now that sounds like a lot, but when you consider that there are an estimated 7 million pupils involved in visits of some kind each year, then while all of course are tragedies, they don't actually happen that often. However, as I say, when there are accidents, they get a lot of publicity, and that has an impact. One result has been the closure of some 20 local education authority outdoor education centres. School trips is a very general term. I mean, the risks and dangers must range from, from significant to very minor. Uh, absolutely, indeed, because each situation needs to be treated separately, and those occasions where things go wrong must be put in perspective. Phil Revel advises learning outside the classroom. We spoke to him at the Geoffrey Museum in London. 
There's been far too much said about accidents in the context of school trips. The reality is, is that accidents are extremely rare events, that children are more likely to die in their own home, um, to, to be hit by lightning, um, than to suffer a fatal accident on a school trip. There has been far too much fear about what may go wrong and not enough appreciation of the value of the experiences to young people when things go right. And they do go right well over 99% of the time. The kind of adventurous activities which are slightly more risky are in fact only a part of what young people do with leaders and with teachers and with schools. This is not a rock face, is it, where we are at the moment. Um, museums, arts, drama, dance, um, heritage visits, all these things are part of the out-of-classroom experience that we should value. Now, you said the government's keen to assuage worries and encourage school trips. What are they doing? Well, they certainly are keen to do that. And earlier this year, in an attempt to reverse this decline in trips, the government published a Staying Safe Action Plan. Now, this set out to reduce the red tape so that no more than three A4 forms should be needed for an off-site visit and proposed quality badges for outdoor centres with a good safety record. The government will also be publishing a new document called Out and About Guidance for schools which is due out this summer. Let's start with the Staying Safe Action Plan. What does that say? Well, the Action Plan says that the risk assessment must be proportionate in order to minimise risk without denying children the opportunity to experience the benefits of learning outside the classroom. And are plans and badges seen as meaningful? Well, they're meant to help, but um, the Conservative spokesman, Nick Gibb, is a bit doubtful whether all this consultation and documents are really going to make much difference. Every week, you know, the department DCSF is, ch is sending these things out to schools. They lie in this, the supply cupboard unread because they, otherwise the teacher wouldn't emerge from reading these things. So, you know, it may well be read by some and may well have an impact, but the key thing is to change the law. That's what needs to happen so that teachers don't feel, th you know, that they're going to be under threat of prosecution or, or legal action if, they, if something goes wrong outside their control when they take a, a group of children out, you know, on, on school trips. Mm, legal action. What's the position on that exactly? Well, I'm not a lawyer, sadly. I'll be earning a lot more. Um, but I know someone who is. Graham Clayton is the senior solicitor at the National Union of Teachers. Let's hear from him. Legally, the position is uh, long-standing. It's so long-standing, it's even described in Latin. It's an old phrase called in loco parentis. And what it means is that the teacher has the responsibility to behave towards the child as would a reasonable and caring parent. That's the duty which teachers owe towards children in their care at any time during the school day or on school trips, whenever they're supervising children. Indeed, for many people, it, it extends beyond teachers. It's a very general description of any adult uh, other than the parent who has responsibility for the care of the child. So that's already a considerable, well understood responsibility. I mean, it's in a teacher's DNA. I think it is. I think people understand that. So really it's about the, the practicalities, making sure you've gone through the right sort of checklist. Let's have a uh, look and see how it's been done on one particular school, Wadon School in Surrey, when they were on a field trip uh, to Iceland. In recent years, several high-profile accidents have deterred teachers from running school trips. But the group is travelling with a reputable tour company and Deborah hasn't been put off. Because if you do a full risk assessment, and certainly Raven Tours provided us with a lot of information as well, it's very different, again, from, from being at home, perhaps walking on a path in a new forest or crossing the road, to actually be somewhere where, actually, if I put one foot wrong, I'm going to end up in that plunge pool, um, or I'm going to slip down a volcano. Um, it does actually put them on their metal a bit. All right, ladies and gents, we're going to be getting off here. We're at Thingvalier. On the trip with ben, Deborah is geography teacher thing, Mark Sharman. And a little bit about that. You brief the students well before you actually get off the coach and before you go to places. They know what to expect as well. And actually, it's not really a problem. Our head of department's actually been out here before, done a, a, a recce of all of the places. So you know what to expect when you get here. And you're also aware that you have to make decisions and change decisions when you arrive. So you're also making on the spot checks just to make sure that everything is OK. We're going to walk down to give you a really close view of it, but be careful, the path may well be quite slippery. There are handrails down, Stanley, and when we get to the bottom, you cut, there's some people down that we're not going to go onto that ledge, but it's far too slippery and far too dangerous. 
The teachers there are taking a very practical approach. Where can they find, about, find out about the principles that underpin that? Well, there is quite a lot of advice about the most important document still is the 1998 report from government, which is on health and safety on education school visits. So they must look at that. There's some new advice coming too as well. And there's lots of supplementary documents on specific things like safety by water, for example, as well. And also local authority will have their advice and the governing body's policy. All of those things they should take care of. A lot of detail in there. Can you pick out any particular points that teachers should be aware of? Uh, yes, indeed, because the headline things for teachers to consider if they're planning a trip are that there should be a designated group leader with overall responsibility for the visit. They should have the head teacher's agreement to any visit. They should follow LEA or governing body guidelines, policies and regulations. They should ensure first aid provision is available. They must ensure the ratio of pupils to supervisors is appropriate and make sure they have details of the pupils' special and medical needs. Now, we've talked a lot about uh, risks and dangers which could scare or, or, or sort of overwhelm some teachers. So, so how, how should they approach managing risk? There is that danger, absolutely, and this is the absolutely central consideration for those conducting school trips and visits, risk assessment. Now, this is a formal assessment of the risks that might be met on a visit, and they should have the aim of preventing the risks or reducing them. Pupils must not be placed in situations which expose them to an unacceptable level of risk. And if the risk cannot be contained, then the visit must not take place. The risk assessment should be based on the following considerations. What are the hazards? Who might be affected by them? What safety measures need to be in place to reduce risks to an acceptable level? Can the group leader put the safety measures in place? And what steps will be taken in an emergency? You call them considerations. What, what factors should a group leader or a teacher be aware of? Well, there are obviously a great many of them, but um, some of the key factors to consider might be these. The type of visit activity and the level at which it is being undertaken. For example, a visit to a, an Icelandic volcano, as we saw there, is very different to a visit to a museum. The location, routes and modes of transport. Uh, we saw the teacher in the clip there telling pupils not to use the path close to the river, for example. The group member's age competence, fitness and temperament, and the suitability of the activity. Clearly a group of under 10s present very different risks to a group of teenagers. The quality and suitability of available equipment, seasonal conditions, weather and timing, a trip to Iceland, ensure pupils have warm clothing, and finally emergency procedures. So lots of useful detail available. It's worth re-emphasising. Things rarely go wrong. I think it is worth re-emphasising that. We heard the figures earlier on. And I think providing teachers follow all this guidance, they will be absolutely fine. If they've done the risk assessment, they should be absolutely fine. And after, you've got to remember the real benefits from this. Mm. I mean, I can still remember going on school trips when I was at primary school about 150 years ago, and I can't remember what else went on in classrooms. So I think they're real benefits. That's what you need to know about school trip safety. For more information, please visit our website. Till next time, from Mike and from me, goodbye.